Good morning. Welcome to this week's episode of The View, where we have some two amazing guests to talk about trauma, trauma respo response ministry, and what all that means and how it impacts our congregations, um, our society. Uh, we have Reverend Julie Taylor, who's the Senior Director of Contextual Ministry, Meadville Lombard Theological Seminary. I'd love to know what that means. Uh, also the current president of the UU Trauma Response Ministry. And we also will be uh, speaking with Reverend Karen Hutt, who is the vice president for student formation, vocation and innovation at United Seminary of the Twin Cities. Uh, and she's also the clinical pastoral educator and board certified chaplain, pediatric and adult trauma chaplain in Chicago. So two incredible guests today. And before we begin speaking with you both, we will be doing our UU Roundup and some um, mixed news this week. Uh, the good news is 50% of the VIEW hosts will be on the Loretta board, the Liberal Religious Educators Association board. And uh, Christina Rivera and I will be, um, will be on. Chris, Chris, would you like to uh, let everyone know what we'll be doing? I wish I knew, <laughs> no. <laughs> um. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christine Rivera. I'm joining you from Charlottesville, Virginia. I forgot, I forgot to do that. I forgot, forgot to, to do an introduction. Else. That's okay. We'll we'll do it. We we can do it any way we want to. <laughs> and we will, as we join the Loretta board, as um, I will be serving as secretary. Aisha is going to be serving as president elect. And um, we have some fantastic um, outgoing board members that we're super. Um, just grateful to for their service and we're really excited to join the board members that will be um, staying on in their in their roles and we actually have some of our first onboarding uh, happening today so uh, we're just really excited to see um, Loretta has done such incredible work over the past um, couple of years to really open and expand their understanding of um, white supremacy culture and how we are looking at dismantling that within Unitarian Universalism and religious education in particular. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to serve. So let's see, Reverend Michael Tino, why don't you introduce yourself? Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino joining you from Peekskill, New York. Um, I'm really glad to be back. Um, I'm not going to be on the Loretta board um, because nobody asked me. Uh, <laughs> So, <laughs> uh, which is just fine. Um, I realize as I'm listening to you all stepping up into new leadership positions that as of General Assembly, I will be without um, a larger portfolio for denominational service for the first time in my, in my career. Uh, so I've got two months to fix that. Um, life is good. I, I've been out for the last two weeks because last week I was in South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Reservation um, with the Oglala Lakota people uh, and uh, my youth group and some adults from the congregation I serve, uh, building relationships and learning about history and um, doing some, some service in, uh, in ways that we hope were accountable. And um, so I'm really, I'm happy to be back. Um, I got this lovely tan in South Dakota. Everyone's like, oh, did you go to Florida? I'm like, nope, South Dakota. Um, where the, the light was reflecting off the snow uh, when I got there. So uh, it's good to be back with you all. Meg Riley, last but not least, how are you? You know, I'm good. The snow is melted here in Minneapolis. I think I took my snow tires off. You know, I think it's over for another year. Um, I wanted to say that I'm on an iPad. So if it looks like I'm looking out the window, that's me looking at everybody that... that <laughs> It's annoying, but the camera's just way off on the side. So if you happen to be watching this. And I also want to say, Michael Tino, I think that doing the view is is denominational service. And it makes sense to me that two of our four hosts are on the Laredo board because I also think it's religious education that we're doing here. And um, and I'm really proud of of the ways that people come and share with us and that I hear all kinds of leaders using this, religious educators, ministers, administrators lay leaders using what we learn here. I know as somebody who's also in a congregation, I'm constantly going, oh, why didn't I know that? Oh, why, why haven't I been doing that? You know, so I think there's, this is, um, 
I, I think, exciting um, congregational, I mean, denominational service. So I'm just going to frame that for you. You don't have to join any more committees, maybe. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's my two cents for the morning. Margaret Lee, what do you got to say? Hello, Margaret Lee coming to you from Connecticut. It's pretty sunny out today, and I even have my... my sliding glass door open. So I, I think at least for us, right? <laughs> at least for us, things are warming up here. Um, as far as um, I'll be with you on Facebook, make sure that the panel is here, has your questions, your comments, and so on. So thank you for uh, being with us. I'm providing tech support, so. Thank you all. And um, some sad news, at least I'm sad about it. Uh, Bart Frost, the director of Youth and Young Adult Ministry, I think is his official title, is uh, leaving the UUA as of uh, July, uh, July 1st, I believe. He's moving back to New Orleans. And so I wanted to give a shout out for um, his service and the youth love him. I cannot uh, say that enough. So um, I'm pretty sad about that. So I just wanted to, and yeah, I, I think, um... I think we're going to be hearing more about that and about um, news coming out of the Youth and Young Adult Office. And yeah, so I think stay tuned. Stay tuned on that. And um, the UUA Board of uh, Trustees is meeting uh, beginning tomorrow, in, or actually today. Um, open session begins tomorrow. And I encourage everybody to, you know, try and tune in. It's super easy to. Um, to actually just kind of put it on your computer and listen as um, as the day goes as the day goes on and, and oh, Christina mm -hmm. as someone who it would never in a million years cross my mind to do that wh why do you, what do you think people would get tell me why I should think differently about that so um, it's really really easy to um, take a look at the um, agenda of the board meeting. The agendas are already up. And I just put into the chat box the actual link to go to uh, and view the board meeting. So for instance, tomorrow at 10 a.m., uh, Susan uh, Frederick Gray will give the president's report. And as part of that, she'll be discussing how the um, UUA is addressing the issues at UU World that we have been talking about uh, for the past intensively talking about in the past couple of months, but I've been talking about for several years. Um, so what a great way to actually hear what Susan has to say about that particular topic, um, as well as other topics that relate to um, her vision and her administration's vision for what the you know, Unitarian Universalism is gonna look like. Um, it kind of gives you a, almost a, like a preview into what she's gonna be talking about at GA. And so you don't have to listen like the entire day. You don't have to participate in the entire board meeting. But you know, pick one hour out of out of the agenda, um, and you know, just throw it onto your screen and you know, put it onto your iPhone or your Android phone and just listen and and hear what the board is talking about. Um, it's really really informative. Thank you. <clears throat> and yes, uh, it is very, it's a lot more interesting than I thought when I first started watching a couple years ago. Um, so we're going to jump right in to our topic today. And Julie, I'm going to start with you and ask to, for you to define what trauma is and what does it mean to be trauma informed? So um, please start. All right. So uh... Thanks for inviting me. I am actually sitting in my office here in Chicago at Meadville Lombard. Uh, so this is part of my office. Uh, we're speaking of uh, considering and thinking about things that can happen. Two days ago, we had an active shooter drill as part of the whole building here. And that's part of what we do as a regular, uh, as a regular thing here. The, um, and the conversations that have come out of that have been pretty interesting too about what does it mean to think about things ahead of time? How does it mean, what does it mean to kind of incorporate the realities of the world into what we're doing as a staff, but then also how does that inform uh, our education and, and what we're doing as we're preparing ministers moving into the future? So um, just something that 
is on my mind because I was in my office with the lights turned off with a you know locked door and a, this chair I'm sitting in shoved up against the uh, up against the door handle uh, playing along because that's what you need to do is is uh, pay attention to this stuff and not just pretend like it's going to go away if we don't think about it. So the idea um, I, I do have a, a I do have a couple of pretty good uh, definitions of, of trauma and then looking at what trauma informed kind of has meant at least academically and then seeing how it's being utilized and how it's being used. And that's, I think, a, a lot of why uh, we got the call to have a conversation about this. So uh, there's a definition that comes from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, for those that are in uh, acronym world. And they collaborated their, they have a, a, a definition on their website where they, they seem they, they have collaborated with a panel of experts to craft the following concept of trauma. So here's their, their concept. And this is a, a little short paragraph. So bear with me with this. Individual trauma results from an event, series events or set of circumstances that, it's, that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. And so that's the beginning of a definition. I've found a, another few of these too. Another piece around that that I'm gonna add on, an experience in which a person's internal resources are not adequate to cope with external stressors. So that can be another layer of this. Um, Trauma can be experienced as physical or emotional harm or threat and can stem from a single event or a series of events or circumstances. Uh, and it's also important to remember that reactions to a traumatic event can be short-term or can result in prolonged and complex reactions. So those are some kind of definitions that come from, uh, that come from SAMHSA, some, some more mental health connected pieces. I also have a book that I'm gonna I'll just read a definition. Shelley Rambo uh, wrote a book called Spirit and Trauma, A Theology of Remaining. And from her introduction, uh, she says, trauma is distinguished from other experiences of suffering in that a person's capacity to respond and integrate the experience is severely impaired. In all cases of trauma, a person's relationship to themselves and to others is fundamentally altered in response to an event. So the piece that I wanna lift up around trauma, and I think we're gonna have this conversation, this is part of what we're gonna talk about, is what trauma is and what it is not. And how that word I think is being, um, is often maybe misused by, certain, by some people. And I'm not gonna take away people's ability to name for themselves. And that becomes really important is that, um, events can happen and people's responses are totally different. People can experience the same event and have very different reactions and responses and integrate it or not integrate that experience. So being able to define that for yourself, I'm not here to take that away, but I'm here to pay attention to a big part of the consistent piece of all these definitions is there's some kind of impairment and, a, and difficulty in, um, in being able to either move forward, not move beyond, but connect uh, later and ways to integrate. And that's a really important thing. Trauma is different than being upset. And an upsetting event is different than an, a traumatic event. And so those, that's really key. And I think that's, I think that's a lot of where we probably where we want to talk about. And uh, so with that, there's a, a, a listing and a connection around care, uh, around trauma informed. And I'm not entirely sure, honestly, where that term has come from originally, but I know that there's it's ways that it's being utilized a lot. I don't know that it's necessarily understood. Um, I actually just took a a, a, a continuing ed course uh, this week, actually on uh, on Tuesday around trauma informed classrooms for those of us that are that are educators, and it was a, a pretty interesting. And one of the pieces that uh, I'm going to take this little definition from one of the slides from that presentation. And they, they look at um, this as being a, a paradigm shift for educators. To be trauma-informed is to understand the ways in which violence, victimization, and other traumatic experiences have affected the lives of individuals that you're working with. So that's what trauma-informed is, is recognizing that there are experiences that then influence the lives of people that we interact with. 
Uh, and then that understanding informs the design of systems and services in order to accommodate survivors' needs and to re remove barriers, This, in this case, to learning. But if we're gonna talk about it in terms of ministry, we would say um, to understand design systems and services in order to accommodate survivors' needs to remove barriers to ministry, to congregational work. I think that's a way to, to shift that. Also that trauma-informed work is a strengths-based, person-centered and solution-focused. So this is not gonna be one size fits all. And that's another piece of this. So that's my definition <laughs> 101 starting point. Well, it seems important, the, the informed part is knowing the difference between someone being upset and uh, reacting in the moment to something, uh, an event that keeps someone from moving forward or connecting to themselves or others. Karen, um, jump, please feel free. What are, oh, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> I, I tend to agree with those definitions and I'm sitting here thinking about all the ways that uh, patients that I've worked with in hospitals over many years have been, uh, their tra trauma informed service for them, particularly black patients in, in main big hospitals um, are traumatized. Going to the hospital is a traumatizing experience for, for many African American patients that I've worked with over the years. Uh, particularly since there are very few people that aren't wearing uh, uniforms who have the freedom to be able to engage with them where they are emotionally and spiritually at the point of the trauma impact, which is right sometimes at the door of the ED where they're coming in. Um, I also think that the historical nature of some of this trauma is also really important for people to have an understanding of. It's not necessarily an event that happened last month. Could have been events that happened you know hundreds and hundreds of years ago that are still informing our bodies are still informing our reactions to things um i i think about um uh, the many times in my own life where i now that i have these wonderful definitions about what was happening to me that these were trauma <laughs> i needed some trauma information about why i'm responding to the way i am to certain things um and so i think that uh, particularly as a black person in America, I'm always living in a trauma-informed experience because I live in trauma constantly. The threat of reintroducing a traumatic impact is always there, but the underlying foundations of, of being um, um, in this very dangerous position that we're in as black people in America, it's a danger to be who I am in this country to myself being. Um, so that's really an important thing. I think when we're caring for others, in, in any kind of setting too, the more information we have about what's informing their um, choices, their behavior, how they understand meaning, um, how they're making meaning, um, how they're finding purpose in their lives are all really important characteristics of being able to provide good care. I know that, um, you know, caring for um, people whose families died in the Holocaust, there's particular kinds of trauma informed experiences and language that um, we have to be able to to draw upon. Um, and there are certain things we need to be careful about as well. Um, so I, I appreciate the definitions. So one of the questions that I have um, is a lot of times we hear from people about triggering, like having a, a content warning for folks that, um, you know, for something that might trigger some someone. And I think I hear it used more broadly than it actually uh, should be used. Um, and I think it gets to that, you know, upset isn't necessarily trauma. And um, so I was just wondering if you can take us through maybe a little bit as, as you all understand it of what um, being triggered might, might be or look like. Well, I, I could respond on my own. Um, I, I've just started, you know, to hear that word, particularly in a classroom setting here in seminary, and people are saying that they need trigger warnings. But the problem I, I have with that is that um, what is a trigger for you may be a, a necessary response for me. So if 
someone is uh, uncomfortable talking about white supremacy and they need a trigger warning because they don't want to talk about that or it upsets them because their father was a racist and they don't want to remember their father and whatever, um, that, that can be problematic for the person who needs to express a particular point of view. So um, I'm kind of uh, neutral on the, the use of that term. Um, I don't, I think it's overused. And um, personally, I, I don't think um, it's realistic to be able to have free and open dialogue without every other sentence being monitored uh, for trigger warning. Well, and I would say also with uh, just that term alone, I think can be problematic, right? When we're looking at shootings that are happening in schools, in congregations, in communities, in households, in neighborhoods, just even using the word trigger warning, I don't think that in and of itself is a helpful, I, I, I think it's been overused. It's, and what it means and what it may have meant is not, is not the way, um, it can always come across, right? Because uh, because there's multiple definitions to trigger and being triggered. And so that in and of itself is not necessarily helpful when we're considering that people have been through and survived uh, shootings. And so now we're gonna talk about a trigger warning that in and of itself can be something to just, inter if you're gonna be trauma informed and recognize using that word, that idea of trauma informed is recognized, recognizing that people um, have things about their past and sometimes their present that are complicated and may cause blocks and abilities to even take in the information that's coming, right? And so if I'm going to be talking about things in my class, I teach intro to pastoral ministry here at Meadville, and that class, <laughs> Margulies, what is one of my students? <laughs> that class is full of deep and sometimes really difficult content that we're going to get into. And like, as Karen's saying, we have to get into that. And so rather than saying this is a trigger warning, what I try to do to pay attention is that at the beginning of class to say, I don't know what you come with. I have no clue what you come into this class with. And honestly, you don't know what I come with either, which is fine and good, but recognize that we may be hitting stuff that's really sensitive. So here's some, here's some way to contain that. Let's pay attention to this. If you, if, if, um, let's talk about it. If you're willing and able, and that's something that's okay and you feel safe, make sure that people are partnering with other folks. Who are your buddies in the class? And if, if I have material that I know has a, is likely to be difficult, I'll talk about it beforehand. And I try to let people know this is what's coming up in this video clip. If this is a problem and difficult for you, you are welcome to, you don't need to be here for this part of uh, the lesson and we can unpack it later. There's also things that can surprise people so that they didn't realize that that was gonna kick something up in them, right? And so let's find out later, come talk to me, make sure you're with a buddy. How do you take care of yourself? Because the world's full of stuff that's upsetting and that can be traumatizing. So I'm also trying to model when you're out in the world and something happens, where are you going to find your connection? Where are you going to find your support so that you can get what you need to be able to do the next things you need to do because ministry is full of this stuff. I also think that trigger warnings, you know, I think this is something that, that white people can really always have to, to shut down conversations and shut down free speech. So I'm worried about trigger warnings with regard to free speech. I think so it, can, it, can, it can make it very difficult. We should be able to hear opposing views, things we absolutely find despicable, um, but, but free speech is important. And I think as Unitarian Universalists, this is a value that we you know, claim to really care about. We have to be really careful about not shutting down people simply because they have uh, a different point of view that you may find triggering. Um, I, I just have some trouble with that. And I also don't think, I think I'd have to shut America down for me not to be triggered. So I don't have that luxury of being Amen. able to correct what I'm going to trigger. I mean, walking down the street, I'm triggered, but where do I go? I've yep. learned to deal with it. So resiliency with regard to what warnings people have, I think uh, is also important. So I wanted to ask a question because I, I am, this isn't something I know a lot about. 
So say on social media, I'm going to share another horrific story of brutality against some community, which is represented in the people that I know are in my social media community. So I do say TW or something to alert, like there are people who might not want to watch this or they might not want to see this, uh, you know, um, another, you know, police convicted of torturing people, whatever it is. So what would you suggest I do say that's appropriate? Because I get it that trigger warning is, is a trigger itself. I mean, so what would you suggest? I mean, because I want to post stuff, especially for people like me who have privilege, who need to see it. But, you know, Elizabeth Wynn said, for some people it's news, for other people it's family. You know, for the people for whom that isn't a news article, it's their family. How would you, what, what do you recommend um, for, for staying open and, and trying to actually look at the hard stuff without getting the people who already know it inside out to have to look at it again when they're trying to eat their breakfast or whatever. Julie, you wanna take this one? I, I just... Well, I think, I mean, Margalee has been posting a couple of things around and I, I would, this is one that I would, the language that I use is, is more along the lines of what she's posting about content warning, or I want you to be aware of the content coming up without just so that that description, brief description, so people can make a choice if they're going to continue to engage in terms of social media, in terms of social media, because that social media is a place where you can choose to engage or choose not to. Uh, and so that's a different, that's different than like in a classroom or in a congregation. Um, th that That's a different piece around there that's not about, yeah, stopping, but allowing folks to choose if I'm going to, I know that I, this is hard for me uh, and I need to make a decision if I'm going to jump deeper, if I'm in a place where I've got the support <laughs> and I'm in the, the mental and spiritual, uh, emotional place where I'm ready to engage this, or I got to hold off and I don't need to be surprised on my commute to now see this. And now I've got to be in the world and this image is hitting my head over and over again. So I think um, I, I like the content, the idea of content warning rather than trigger warning is just a heads up. It's like heads up, make your decision, be informed. It's almost like a conformed and informed consent kind of a piece too. I wanna go back to what you were talking to about Julie with um, when you're uh, teaching students and um, letting, there, there, and Karen, you said this too, there are things you have to hear and learn. So my background's in social work and I went to school at Hunter College in New York City. And one of the first, my very first classes, first week was you, it, we, the terms are transference and counter-transference. So you have to, first thing you have to do is get your shit together and understand what is going to push your buttons because you will work with the spectrum of people who will push, push all of them. So if you're not on top of what is happening with you, then you will not be able to, they were very clear. You're, this is not going to work for you. That is what we look for. Um, an, an integral part of my training and my um, social work training was uh, field placement and having a supervisor anal, you know, uh, assess how much I was uh, working through, because it's not that it's not going to happen, working through what was uh, pushing my buttons. And, and that's how you become self-differentiated enough so that we, this, this is the nature of what we do and the ministry we're in in the world. So um, I, I was surprised to learn. I think it's happening more now, but I was surprised to learn when I was looking into, because I did consider the ministry because anybody who, you know, goes into any kind of religious leadership immediately gets told, go to seminary. So I looked into it and I was actually surprised at how little of that part of um, the training, at least the schools I looked at, uh, made that a, a central part of what happens because of how much of service is done, whether you're a community minister or in a school setting or in a congregational setting. Um, I didn't think there was enough of that actually. So I'm very grateful that the, that was the path I took because it has very much uh, been useful in my life and in the, in religious education. And do either of you see that that's, I think Meadville is doing more of that, but have either of you seen that there's more of, especially for ministers and uh, service providers, that there's more of the paying attention to transference and counter-transference? A lot of that, 
a lot of that work gets done for people that are in ministry and clinical pastoral education when they're actually doing clinical work and coming back and reflecting on it right in the moment. So they go into the room and they meet an alcoholic who's jaundice and is dying and they have a father who is an alcoholic and then they come back to the group and then they got a chance, a place to process it. So, you know, all of that is the place where that happens. I think it happens more in the clinical training in the same way that social work has clinical training with reflection. Um, without that clinical supervision, uh, that work doesn't always get done. Um, otherwise, there's references in classrooms, as Julie can attest, in teaching pastoral care. Um, and it's certainly through readings and articles and people's stories and role play, all that's a way of teaching that. And I think people are paying attention to it. Um, here in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, um, a group of us have been gathering uh, doctors, chaplains, theologians, and um, hospital administrators to talk about, uh, in fact, the, all of Hennepin County Health, the big public hospital, uh, quasi-public hospital, is um, doing a whole trauma-informed training with all of their staff. The entire hospital staff is getting this training. So that's where a lot of that work is happening right now in, in healthcare. Um, so there are places where the training is happening, uh, where the language is being explored, and the interdisciplinary nature of this work. Certainly social work, as you mentioned, Aisha, is a place where that has always been held. Um, but social work and social workers and chaplains and other care providers and other healthcare and uh, service settings also are working together to create new assessment tools and models to explore interventions and strategies to address these issues with patients and families. I wish it was a lot longer. I think CPE is what, like you could do it in a few months or I wish it was actually a full year because I do it think can people be, know, it. It can, be. it can be a year. Some people do it over an extended period, which is nine months. Some people do an intensive 12 week full time. And then there's also full-time residencies that are three units of CPE in the course of a year in which the student is being paid as well, the resident. So there's an opportunity to do more. In fact, and, more, yeah. Well, I, I wanted to speak more about the, because it, tra when we talk about trauma, you and you said this perfectly, you're walking down the street and there's trauma in a black body, in a black and brown body, right? I'm an immigrant and and, speak to what is happening right now, Julie and Karen, in naming that all trauma, it's, I don't want to say all trauma is not equal, that's not what I mean to say, but inter, it, including an analysis of oppression and generational trauma um, in what, what the learning is right now. How is that happening? Or is it? Oh, I'm trying, I thought Karen was going to talk. So I think there's some of that, some of those pieces are starting to be recognized, but that's part of the slowness of, you know, and, you know, how, white supremacy can slow a lot of things down in terms of exposing and being willing to jump into things and expose the, you know, how am I going to say this? I don't really do diplomatic very well. All right. So how are, <laughs> What are the ways to use trauma that, that white supremacy and those of us with white skin privilege on a regular basis hurt and sometimes actually traumatize people that don't hold the same privilege that we have? That happens regularly, ongoing. For those of us that, are, that, that have and hold white privilege and are, we're part of this white supremacy culture. This is some of what has been being talked about, right? And me as a white person, it doesn't matter the other, the other marginalized identities that I have. I mean, they, those matter, but in terms of my white privilege and that all that I exist around, that happens around me as part of that, the best I can do is try to do less harm. I'm never gonna do no harm, but can I do less harm? And when I do harm, can I reflect on that? Can I get it? Can I try it? Can I do everything I can to not do the same harm more than once? Can I work to uh, not just apologize, but make amends, which means change the behavior so that I don't do the same things and try to reconnect where it is appropriate unless too much harm has been done. And then sometimes my best course of action is to 
not be around that and to just extricate myself from a situation, right? So I think there's some acknowledgement and understanding around uh, that we have to acknowledge around how whiteness, how white supremacy, that culture is going to continue if we're not if, if we're not paying attention to that to actually harm and traumatize other folks. And so if we're thinking about trauma informed ministry, those of us that are white and are part of congregations and we're part of a denomination that has a lot of pieces of white supremacy is part of our denomination. If we're going to do trauma informed ministry, acknowledgement, understanding and figuring out how white supremacy and the and the harm that comes from that is part of ministry is is going to we have to have that as part of the conversation to recognize what that does. If that if that makes sense. I, I think that that's that's important for, for the work for white people. I'm just yeah. thinking about, you know, how do I deal with the, the trauma? And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I watch you all. I watch white people try to figure this all out. And I, I kind of, you know, just observe. Um, but racism and all of that is, is your problem and you have to deal with it and solve it, obviously. But for on me, on the other side, there's a certain kind of resilience that I have baked in me to deal with all, I mean, if I, I believe that my DNA has been restructured to deal with white supremacy almost, and that it's been, been handed down from generation to generation to generation about certain tools and certain behaviors, certain postures that I even take physically around white people, uh, humor, absolutely humor. Uh, if you look at, I, I was trying to get some UU, kids of color to, to look at uh, people of color humor about racism, about how, and, and how that's resilience, how that builds your resilience to be able to have this superpower to analyze. And so there's all these things that we do to address these issues um, that keep us sane. I mean, it's really about creating a safe, not safe, but a sanity place for us. Otherwise, we would lose our fucking minds. Excuse my French here, but um, there's there's no way we wouldn't be we wouldn't be here if we didn't have resilience to the traumas that are historical and um, ever occurring. I mean, I was at the Finding Our Way Home conference in Miami. I leave my hotel room, and a woman, a white woman, just hands me a bunch of dirty towels and says, I'm going to need new towels in this room. I'm leaving my room. I'm not the fucking maid. But that's what she does, okay? So I dropped them on her feet, and I said, I think you better go and wash them out because uh, I'm not going to do that for you. You know, I said some things and uh, just walked away, you know, but so th this kind of, and then laughed. I laughed about it because it was ridiculous. But, um, you know, other white people, when they heard about it, um, were, 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 were just so, they were traumatized by hearing about that experience. They said, this is so traumatic for you. I said, no, it's not traumatic. This is an everyday life experience of which I have multiple responses for. I have a litany. I have resources. I have glossaries. I have books of stuff. And that's what we have to continue to teach our people is how to do that. And I think a lot of Black UUs don't have those skills because they're not in Black communities, many of them. I'm just I'm going to talk about Black people, so I'm not going to say people of color because that doesn't apply to me. But um, as I'm not a person of color. I'm Black. Oh, sorry. But uh, that's, that's what I think. I think we uh, uh, people need to gain those skills from being in communities with other people of color. Well, and that's also looking back at the definition, right? An event is the event in and of itself may not be traumatic. It's how it is experienced and able to be integrated, dealt with or not, right? These, and that's why the same event can affect people different ways. And so assuming that because an event happens that that's traumatized people is inaccurate. And that's also, I think, where this overuse of some of this language comes in. I also have to say, I think, so as a white, as a white person and somebody who's been watching this and, and seeing kind of language and shifting, I think there's also been, for a lot of us that hold privilege, the, the appropriation of the term traumatized. It, I think that part of that is appropriation. 
And some of it, I, I think, again, goes back to this idea around, right, upset. Well, if I'm really upset by something, I might not get enough either attention or I may not get enough support or I may not. So it like I got to kick it up to I'm traumatized. And I'd like to I would like to give permission for anybody to to re um, to reconnect and reclaim words like upset. I'm hurt that that's good enough and that's legitimate enough to be upset, to be hurt, to be bothered, to be confused, that's legitimate. And using those more, uh, more nuanced terms is actually likely, if we pay attention to that, to actually allow, by, by using those more nuanced terms, may allow for us to actually get what we need, to be taken care of in the ways that are actually gonna get the work that needs to be done because traumatized, honestly, in my line of work, if someone's actually traumatized, there's a whole lot of different tools that need to be brought in, a lot of different services, different resources. And so that's, that's a, a, a more, I think, appropriate use because this appropriation is serious around, but I'm not going to get enough. I'm not going to get the help if, unless I blow this up into a giant, giant uh, level. What about me? What about me? And so Let's reclaim some of those languages. Let's reclaim that language, reclaim those words and allow healing. I'm just wondering, are we over, uh, I mean, I didn't even notice this in my, my teenager who's 18 um, and throughout her high school years, all of her friends had lots of language um, from um, psychology that they were using um, to diagnose one another, to um, frame people's behavior in classes, uh, to argue with teachers using certain kinds of language, talking about, you know, I'm traumatized, I don't need to be in this class. So the watering down or the, the democratization of psychological language, the, the, the pop the, is, is become an issue uh, because everybody's using it, everybody's diagnosing everyone, everyone is uh, using this kind of freely without the professional credentials to actually diagnose anyone. And I think that's also a problem. So that's, that actually connects to some of the, the comments. We have a lot of people commenting online and, and um, it's really hard to keep and keep track. Margali is doing a fantastic job of relaying your comments to us as we're, as we're in the middle of this interesting conversation. But Joel, Joey Castile in particular asks about um, how this if whether this is this work is connected to uh, UU organizations doing mental health advocacy, because I think Karen, you you point out very wisely that um, some people have training in mental health and some people do not, and um, so I'm wondering about the people who actually have training in um, mental health informed ministry. Uh, and whether whether there are connections here that have been made, that are being made, that should be made. Um, do either of you know about anything like that or are connected to those groups? I, I am not. Um, I know that at my church, First Universalist, um, here in Minneapolis, we had a mental health day where a lot of that language was was explored and I know churches are doing um, using mental health professionals within their congregations for support groups, for defining these terms, for taking some of creating more um, uh, space for people to have conversations about mental health challenges within their families and in their communities. Um, certainly, that's going on on a congregational level. Um, can anybody here speak to anything that's happening in the level of the UUA? I mean, I, I know just like as part of the UU Trauma Response Ministry, we are not mental health professionals as a team. However, we have a number of members of the team that are, we have clinical psychologists, we have social workers, we have people that, and we have some clergy who are also social workers. We have dually trained clergy, and, and this is just, in the denomination, folks exist. And that's a, wait, let me tell you, when folks are theologically trained, and clinically trained. And I mean, not just like having, I mean, I'm a board certified chaplain, Karen's a board certified chaplain. I mean, like a licensed mental health professional as well as being clergy, that's a powerful combination in terms of referral opportunities. 
And so one of the things that I, that I know that we do on the trauma response ministry team is we maintain as, as many referrals as resources as we can. We're always trying to cultivate uh, new opportunities and places and, and ways to, to do referrals. There may not be as a denomination, if, if we don't have a network as a denomination, in some ways that's okay because our commute, there's resources in every community where there, you use are, there are mental health resources. And so it's really important to connect to whatever your resources are where you are. And it's also really important for those of us that may be doing referrals, be lay people, lay pastoral care communities, clergy, religious educators, we should also do what we can to screen those referral resources because just because someone's got initials before their name or after their name doesn't necessarily mean that they are uh, end all be all knowing all pieces around certain kinds of issues that can come up. So screening those referral resources becomes really useful, really useful. And as much as we can do that, you know, I, I still, I'm old enough now that, um, that I still think in terms of Rolodex, right? Like, how are you going to update your Rolodex, <laughs> your virtual or actual uh, Rolodex? I still somewhere have the cards with the weird, I, I have them still. So how are you going to keep those up to date? Because one of the other difficulties is places that we refer, things shift, things change, people are there, they move. You need to find referral resources, people that take insurance, places that don't take insurance. What are we going to do? Uh, where are the safe places for folks that maybe don't have documentation that are worried about going to anywhere that maybe looks official? How are we going to uh, refer in all those different uh, aspects? It's really important. I have an exercise I do in my class where we actually, uh, we spend a good t amount of time uh, coming up with what referrals might you need? And we fill the entire, Marley can attest to this, right? We fill the entire space. Um, it's, there's a, a whiteboard that goes across the entire classroom. It gets filled. And those aren't the individual, the individuals. Those are just categories of referrals that you may need. I mean, it's that in depth. And so if the more we can do that, the more powerful our, our connections are outside the community. And we're really part of a community player then as you use and not by ourselves thinking that we are the end all be all and have everything. Yeah, I think it'd be really interesting uh, to take the term since their alliteration is always fun. Triggers, trauma and triggers. Um, UU Sunday, have some UUA resources prepared, you know, what it is, what they are and what they aren't and how your congregation can be equipped to, to have this conversation about traumas and triggers. Um, I think that that could be a very useful resource. And I see some of the chat down there is indicating that there are some people already maybe working on this through the UUA through um, some of these resources, I guess Michael or Aisha could, could share what these were. Uh, equal access is involved in mental health issues, as is the um, access and inclusion ministry program. And I imagine if you Googled either of those, maybe on the UUA website, um, you would find uh, access to them. Julie, can you say, say more say, about who? Oh, sorry. I wanted I to ask about the something? trauma. Yeah, go ahead. Because um, I'm not a clinical psychologist, but my girlfriend is, who with a, who spent a life in trauma. I mean, working with PTSD and trauma. And she's, she looks at what churches do and says that we do exactly the wrong thing a lot. She said the research shows that after something like a school shooting, going and getting everyone to share their feelings immediately is the worst idea possible. That actually for a lot of people who aren't traumatized, sharing their feelings immediately traumatizes them. And so a lot of people, if they're just left alone, have natural mechanisms to heal and then a little bit later, you can really see who's in trauma, who's really stopped and work very intensively with them. And she says, churches are always getting everybody to share their feelings about everything. And it actually impedes healing sometimes. So Julie, you're nodding, I see. Have you seen this happening in churches? Yes, and actually that's one of the reasons why people actually need to get training if they're gonna be doing work. You know, don't, and I, I, I hate to say this, I honor and bless people with big hearts that want to help. That's really important and great. But over the, I've been doing this work for coming up on 18 years. And what I have seen is that the people with the big hearts that just go, what we call self-deploy, 
uh, wind up hurting themselves and they hurt the people that they're there hoping to help. And so that's the first thing is get training and just having a big heart and wanting to listen. And that's really good. And that's really, those are great. Those are great beginnings, but that's not enough. You need to get trained. And some of the work that I do and, the, and there's also different levels of training, right? There's a level of clinical psychology. There's a level of social work. There's a level of even board certified chaplain that is different kinds of training that uses different skill sets. There's also crisis intervention training that hits a very different spot on the continuum of care using different techniques and skill sets. What you're talking about, Meg, is absolutely, absolutely right on. You know, if you think, oh, um, somebody's upset, let's get them to talk about it, that can be damaging to people. And the most important thing, and this is um, actually the crisis intervention training uh, that I've been doing, um, I think I started in 2006, uh, it di didn't have the fancy uh, trauma informed whatever, but that's exactly what it is, is uh, crisis intervention work is trauma informed in that it is led by the person who's affected to be able to go to the direction that they wanna go to the extent that they wanna go. And a lot of it is providing resources and making sure that they have what they need for right now and know, and then know what, if next steps are gonna come, what might those next steps be and getting resources to them. That is so important. And with the UU Trauma Response Ministry, all of our responders are actually trained in crisis intervention. Some of our folks are also trained in bigger counseling pieces. Some, but those are different. Those are different. And what are the, one of the key parts in this, what you're talking about, Meg, is so key around groups. That, there's an individual level around this, but also groups. They're absolutely, all the research shows, do not, you don't mix groups. People that have been part of an event, you treat and have different tools and different resources and there's different processes than people who heard about it or people who care about the people that went through an event. And you, you don't mix those groups when they're processing. Now that's also a different piece too. And this is something also to think about the difference of doing the work that's connected to processing and, um, and other kinds of work that needs to happen in congregations that connects to ritual, that connects to the bigger healing of community. And so that stuff's really nuanced. And let me just, just to give a plug for the trauma response ministry, if something happens in your community, please give us a call because we can help, we can help folks think through, talk through, consider how that nuance is gonna play out and what tools are the right tools to use at the right time. I mean, you know, think, think about all tools. Tools can help or they can harm. A scalpel can save a life or it can take a life, depending on the skill and the knowledge of the person using it, as well as the timing. And so the, all those pieces are part of it. And let me tell you something, when you're in a community and it hits the fan, here's the hard thing. <laughs> when something hits the fan, you, even if you're a leader of a community, you're now in the soup with everybody else. And so you won't be able to do your best thinking to figure all those things out. That's why you call in outside folks to support, right? To help those pieces. Um, and, uh, and anyway, so the UU trauma response team is one of the great ways uh, to do that and to get that training. I'm actually teaching uh, here the two day uh, crisis intervention, pastoral crisis intervention as a class uh, here at Meadville in the summer term. It's going to be a weekend class where people can come and do the two-day training. I know Michael's taken it from me before, <laughs> Margulies. So that, that course is actually going to be part of the curricula here at Meadville, and anybody can come and audit it and take the class. Um, and the team, you know, we teach it through the team too. One way or the other, if you're going to be part of it, get training. And if you're not, if, if you're not going to, then make sure you're calling people who do have appropriate training to come and help. And I'm sorry, ministers, your one unit of CPE is not the same thing. Thank you, it is not. <laughs> um, Mar Margulie, can you, um, Julie, I wanted to ask about, you said call the trauma response team. Can you let folks know how to do that practically? And and who would, is it is it a UUA wide? Who would be, just speak a little bit more about technically how folks can plug in and what kind of calls you get? Sure. Uh, so the team gets, uh, we get, we can get calls from anybody. It's not that only a minister or only a staff member has to call. Uh, when incidents happen, we get calls from 
religious educators, we get calls from board presidents, from ministers, from congregational life staff. We, we find out about things. There's a hotline, which I'll look up here when I'm done talking that can be posted in the link. I know um, uh, that I just sent the, uh, the website is, is www.traumaministry.org. And I don't trust my memory. It's like doing math in public. I don't trust do I remember phone numbers in public either? So I'm looking that up. Our hotline uh, is 888-760-3332. And so we actually have somebody on call um, that will take a call and, and uh, the kinds of calls we get and then make as assessments as to what is needed. We'll get calls from everything like, um, you know, the, uh, we've been on site, I was on site uh, for, uh, the shooting in Knoxville uh, coming up on 11 years ago. So big events like that, certainly, but also we get calls from DREs where uh, like there's been a suicide in the community of a youth, not necessarily the, a youth in the youth group, but it's a youth in the community that half the youth group knows. What do we do about that? We get calls about that. It doesn't necessarily mean that we would send somebody to that event, but we coach people through that we have handouts that we send. And so that's part, oh, I'm hearing that the link doesn't work. There's all of a sudden there's some issues so, on some servers, our link goes through just fine. And on some servers, it goes to a Viagra sale. I don't, we're trying, we're working on that. And it all seems to depend on if you're using Google Chrome or you're using, we're working on that. And if, if there's anybody out there that's good at that, let me know because we need somebody to help. We're an all volunteer organization. We have no funding. We need help with our website. At any rate, um, those are the kinds of things that we work on and are happy to coach and, and work through things that, that come up with folks when stuff's happening. And if it's the other thing that's important, if it's not our Ballywick, we will help get you to the place and the resources where that is where you can utilize some services. Thank you, Julie. What an important ministry. And Karen, do you have anything? Any? We are down to three more minutes in this incredibly important conversation. Uh, Karen, and then any other hosts want to say any uh, final thoughts? Well, I just want to say it's good to have this conversation and to keep having it in our congregations and in our organizations and amongst ministers and amongst pastoral care teams. Uh, it's just important to keep the language. Uh, I, I notice as language changes, as meanings change, as words get uh, deconstructed, that we have to constantly refresh our training and our memory um, about these words because they all mean different things to different people. But um, coming up with some opportunity for us to keep talking about it is, is really important. I'm glad that we had a chance to do that here. Thank you so much, Michael, Chris, Meg, any final thoughts, Marguerite? Okay, thank you all so very much. This has been another uh, outstanding, uh, rich and really important conversation. Next week, we have the Reverend Matthew Johnson of the UUMA uh, to talk about UUMA accountability. So looking forward to next week, another great conversation, I'm sure. And thank you all. And other members of the UUMA accountability the task group or whatever they're called. That's great. A, a conversation that will, be sure to make some people uncomfortable. Really? <laughs> you don't say. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks Bye. for this. Thank you so much. Thank you.